God and what God wants to give him, sin seems utterly sinful to him. He says, no way, I can't do that. I can't give myself to that. A few more verses on the oracle. Acts 17, verse 38. Stephen is preaching and he talks about Moses. He said, Moses received the word of God like a living oracle burning in him, is what the implication is. He received a living oracle from the living God on Mount Sinai when the mountain was flame of fire. That's Acts 7, verse 38. When Moses received the living oracle, it's more than a teaching. I give a lot of teachings, but every now and then I get a hold of an oracle and I'm, I'm willing to take whatever losses that I incur. And that's when I'm praying that the Lord will cause this message to become like an oracle within your heart. That's the point of why I'm taking it. And because I believe it happened in this season of David's life that we just looked at in the last session. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. Peter's exhorting people. He says, let the person who speaks, let the man or the woman who's speaking the word, let them speak as the oracle of God. He's saying, get a flame of fire on you. He's, he's not pressuring them to you know, to just turn up the, you know, turn up the amps and kind of, you know, do a lot of soulish enthusiasm. He's not talk, telling them to shout and scream and, you know, froth around and stuff. But that's not what he's saying. He's telling them, Peter's saying, get into a flow of reality so that when you speak, you have an oracle flowing out of you. He's appealing for fiery, prophetic, reality preaching. Preaching that comes from revelation, that comes from experience, that comes out of reality with God. Oracle preaching, if you will, is the need of the hour. It's not the only need of the hour, by the way. We need line upon line teaching. We need pastoral preaching. We need, but we need that oracle preaching restored to the pulpits again across the land. When that volcanic eruption makes a man or a woman a trumpet of God, it doesn't matter if there's ten people there. It's something that's living and burning within them. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the size of the audience. I'm talking about the the, the size of the fire in the heart, that that eruption would take place and they're speaking or they're singing or they're writing as the very oracle of the Lord. Or they're praying. An intercessor could pray with a, as an oracle before the Lord or a singer or a writer or a preacher. There's just too much performance preaching going on where we're trying to endear the people to ourselves. That kind of performance thing that just endears people like, wasn't that lovely? He is such a good guy. Isn't she something special? Or that political preaching that gets us to avoid the necessary conflicts that are related to righteousness. That political preaching where we just get it just right so we can avoid the hassles that righteousness bring in, an, in a fallen world. I've done enough of both of those in my life to know of what I'm talking about, that those things don't bring life. They really don't bring life. There's four sections to Psalm 36. Four sections. Four parts. And they're, it's a magnificent psalm. I mean, it's wonderful. Verse 1 to 4. It's a graphic picture of sinful man without the beauty of God. It's a graphic picture. I mean, it's a graphic picture. It's one of the most poignant pictures of sin, these four verses. How ugly the human heart gets without the beauty of the Lord in redemption. Really bad. And I believe that David's thinking of Saul when he writes this. And the court around Saul that's just yielding to Saul's evil spirit and they're turning things on David. I believe that David has got names and faces in mind when he's writing this in the pain of his heart. Verses 1 to 4, that graphic picture of sinful man without the beauty of God in redemption. Verses 5 and 6, oh, fantastic. A picture of the beauty of God who's patiently enduring sinful man. Verse 5 and 6. A picture of the beauty of God. It's five, uh, uh, actually four, magnificent statements of the beauty of God. As God is patiently enduring the sinful people in the first four verses. Because the contrast is deliberate. The next section, the third section, is verse 7 to 9. It's the picture of the beauty that God offers sinners in redemption. Verse 7 to 9, one of the commentators said, perhaps one of the most wonderful, powerful passages of uh, descriptions of redemption in the whole Bible. No, he said the whole Old Testament. Verses 7 to 9. The picture of the beauty that the beautiful God offers sinful people in redemption if they want it. Verses 9 to 10, 7, 8, and 9 is magnificent. Magnificent. I know I'm kind of overdoing it, but I'm not really. It is magnificent. 
opposite. It is one of those really a uh, highlight passages in the Word of God. And then verse 10 and 11, uh, 10 to 12, the fourth section, the picture of David praying for this full redemption to come into his experience and, and into uh, to the into the experience of the redeemed. God, David is. It's a picture of David praying for more of the manifestation of this beautiful, this beauty of redemption. For a greater manifestation of his praying, Lord, bring us into it now. He turns it into prayer. He turns his revelatory insights of the first three sections, he turns them into intercession, of course, which is one of the main practices of David in the Psalms. He gives revelation, revelation, and then at the end he turns the revelation into intercession. David has tremendous confidence that the Lord's redemption is going to be manifest. Let me tell you where it's going, just kind because of, I'm kind of breaking uh, my uh, outline here, but I just got to get you just to the feel of it so you can get excited as we're, as we're working our way there. Verse 8, one of the pinnacle passages that David describes, the, the personality of God. We looked at it in the first couple sessions of, of this course. You will give them drink from the river of your pleasures. That the very personality of God, the beauty of God made known to the human spirit is depicted as a river of pleasure. And that God is going to give these outrageously sinful men the beauty of God and, and let them drink from the river of divine pleasure if they will but be willing. His patience is so great, He will give them access to the river of delights, the river of pleasures. So many implications to that statement. But the very personality of God is rooted and grounded in gladness and delight. The God we serve is a God of indescribable, inexhaustible delights within Himself, about Himself, about His Son, and about His kingdom, and about His people. He's a God of fierce passion, of fierce delight. And when He reveals that and brings us into the experience of it, it's called the river of pleasures. What a statement. David's paradigm of God, David's view of the of the person of Jesus Christ, a God of infinite spiritual pleasure. He can't get enough of Him. David's theology, and we've underlined this many, many times and emphasized that, that God's way to get us freed from inferior pleasures of sin is to introduce into our experience the superior pleasures of the knowledge of God. I'll say that again. The, the, the clearest doctrine of holiness that I know in the Bible the way that God motivates us out of the inferior pleasures of sin is He introduces into our experience the superior pleasures of the beauty of God. When the human spirit is touched with the knowledge of God, it is so satisfying that sin loses some of its dominating power in our experience. The power of sin is diminished. I didn't say sin has gone away and you don't feel the temptation. It's diminished in its dominance in our life. A man or woman that's touched in the delight of the discovery of God in the inner man is significantly less prone to yield to sin. I didn't say they won't sin. David sinned after this. But the, the power, the hold of sin in the soul is significantly diminished when we walk in the pleasure, when God reveals God to the human spirit, when the paradigm, the view of God is one of a delightful, beautiful God that brings us into His beauty, it exhilarates the human spirit. And sin just doesn't look near so appealing. So something I say a lot, that a, a man or a woman of God that is happy in the Lord, they sin less, they fight less, they quit less, they divide less, they complain less, they work more, they give more. A person happy in God does all the good stuff more and all the bad stuff less. I tell you they do. A happy person just sins a lot less and complains a lot less. Or something's beaten alive in their spirit. There's a heartbeat of God and, and somebody treats them wrong and they go, ah, so that's nickel and dime stuff. Something big's going on in my life, you know. They just stole my car. I can always get another car, you know. I mean, you can get a car. We lose our life over, you know, little $100, $500, $5,000 things that happen and we lose our life in God over it. But a person that gets a hold of divine pleasure, those things begin to appear smaller in their estimation. And that's the power of, that's the power of David's theology, the holy passion. I love what uh, uh, John Piper said. He says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. I love that sentence. 
God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in Him. He's most glorified in us in the book, The Pleasures of God. A tremendous book on, I really recommend it. It will thrill you. He talks, the subtitle of the book is something like The Delight That God Has in Being God or something like that. It's a wonderful subtitle. The Pleasures of God, The Passions of God's Personality. Well, that's where David's taking us. That's where David's taking us. David is stabilized, I believe, in the first Samuel 17, 18, 19, or 20, 18, 19, or 20 season. I believe he's on the verge of being exiled, verse 11, from the king's court under Saul, not under Absalom. I believe it's the first, it's, it's the first setting. And again, the commentators, they say we're not sure which one it is. I believe it's the beauty of the Lord that David beheld in the early days of his life that sustained him all through those years. The stabilizing force in David's life. I mentioned Sunday. It's the stabilizing force in Job's life. Job 26 to 31, those five chapters, when Job speaks of the beauty of the Lord that stabilized him. We look Sunday at the beauty of the Lord that stabilized the bride in the Song of Solomon in chapter 5. She was lovesick in 5 8 because of the grandeur of Jesus in chapter 5, verse 10 to 16. We looked at that just briefly. But it's the idea, the beauty of God stabilizes us. And I think that's what's happening in this season of his life of turbulence. It says at the very beginning that it's, he, David wrote this psalm to give to the chief musician. Or to the, uh, the chief musician is, is a man. His name was Chenaniah. He led the singers. He led the musicians. And he led the public worship. He was in the tabernacle of David. He was over the whole thing. And David went to him and gave him this song. It says, he, David had already put it to music. He says, now get the singers to sing it and the musicians to play it and the people to worship and bring them into the experience of the Lord. So David wrote this purposely for, for, for public worship. This is the kind of thing that I believe that, that I don't know that uh, it would just be line by line that, that you would sing, but, but, but the unfolding of the meaning of it, there's tremendous seeds there for worship songs and prophetic singing because that's why David wrote it in the tabernacle of David, for these truths to be unlocked and unpacked, if you will. Not that you have to just sing it line upon line. But I believe that these psalms contained themes in the Lord that the singers unfolded. Okay, let's look at the first section. Verses 1 to 4. And I don't want to go too long on it, but it's a, such a graphic, striking description of sin. It's, it's a picture of sinful man before the beauty of redemption. They said no to God. And again, the, the reason... This is such an important first four verses. It's a striking graphic description. But the next two verses, five and six, is what God is like in light of these evil, wicked people. What He wants to give them. It's just it's striking. The, the contrast is deliberate. Sin only appears in its full horror in the light of the beauty of God and in the light of what God's offering us. As I was just studying this and just last week and... I saw how horrible sin is, the full, you know, the horror of sin. The unthinkable perseverance of sinful people before a God that wants to offer the kind of experience of pleasure. And I said, I'm never going to sin again. This is stupid to sin. The logic, of course, I will sin again, but the logic of this passage is, is, is powerful. When you get caught up in it, you just say, why am I doing this? Why am I, you know, feeding on mud when I have the splendor of God to delight myself with? Why am I doing this? This doesn't make sense. So it's an oracle within David's heart against the transgression of the wicked. And I think he's thinking of the wicked in Saul's court, and I think he's thinking of Saul as well. He gives a full picture of the height and depth of sin in contrast to the beauty of God. And then sin appears exceedingly sinful in the contrast. It starts off, verse 1, there's no fear of God before us. He says they don't have any respect for God. They don't have respect for God. They don't have desire for God's approval. That's what he means. They have no desire for God's approval. They're not thinking about it. They're thinking about getting ahead in the king's court. They're thinking of getting Saul happy with them instead of God happy with them. They don't fear the Lord. They fear Saul right now. Because there was, Saul had a whole machinery that had to operate to get David kicked out. I mean, he had a a number of people that had to sign on with him to make life, David's life miserable. Saul didn't just do it by himself. He got his court, his key guys going, yeah, that young kid is causing a lot of trouble. I agree. 
It was just, it was just rank wickedness going on. David says they have no desire for God's approval. Equally perilous, they have no fear of God's disapproval. They have no fear of God's disapproval. They have no thoughts of God's judgments. That's what he means by no fear of the Lord. No thought of his judgment. No fear of God's disapproval. No concern or respect for who God is. He goes, look at them. They only care about what Saul will give them. That's, I think, deliberately, what's, I mean, specifically what's on his mind. He goes on in verse 2 and he says, let me tell you why. He has the singer sing it, his theology. He goes, let me give you the logic. The reason they have no respect for God. Because they flatter themselves in their own eyes. They live in self-flattery. They live in an elevated sense of their importance outside of the economy of God. Beloved, you'll never understand, you'll never exhaust your importance in the economy of God. You will never know how important you are to God, to the heart of God and the the height of the exaltation he has, He's given His bride. We'll never exhaust who we are in the economy of God, but this was opposite. They had a false esteem of who they were outside of the economy of God. Where they were in their position seemed so important to them, they flattered themselves. They deceived themselves about what sin was about. And these kind of people, they're really easy on, on in their own lives about sin. They see sin in everyone else's life, but not their own. They're really easy with themselves. Of course, to the unbeliever, they flatter themselves that eternal judgment's not real, that eternity's not real, that God's not real. They flatter themselves that they don't sin that much, they're going to live real long. They just deceive themselves and flatter their hearts, David says. And of course, when people lose respect for God, it's not long before they lose respect for people. And then killing David seems logical. It's the way forward in Saul's scheme. He goes on and says he flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates. He says he connects with new veins and new fountains of iniquity in his own life. The perverse man sins and after a few years he gets good at it. He discovers new propensities of sin. He discovers new fountains of iniquity in him as he, as he goes on the path. And then it says and then he hates. He, he begins to hate himself. He even hates the very thing he's doing, but he's addicted to it. And he hates everything around him. He's filled with self-disgust. Boy, what a graphic description. Oh, how perilous it is when we discover a, a new fountain, a negative propensity, a perversion, because we've followed the path of sin. And we find it too. We, we had to discover that experience that Paul talks about. There, He gave them over. He allowed them to allow the next series of consequences of emotional depravity to take place in their life when they discover new veins of sin in their, within their makeup. Ew, it's, like, it's horrible. Again, verse 3, the words of the mouth are wicked and deceitful. Of course, a flattered heart, a self-flattering heart, always has deceptive words. A man or a woman that lives in flattery about themselves, about the fact their sin doesn't really matter, they, 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 it's easy for them to walk in deceptive words. Again, it's in David's situation in the court, they, the thing, the very thing David wouldn't do, that it, we so easily present ourselves as the victim or the hero, and the other people as the perpetrators against us. Our language, our conversations, our fellowship, we're, we're the victim or we're the hero of the story. We're the one delivering everyone or the one that is being victimized and that's the very thing David militated against in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. Three times he acted wisely. He would not give himself to that self-flattering, deceitful words. He said, I won't do it. I won't go there. What a powerful thing. He says, I'm going to... I'm not going to endear myself to them and, and undermine to others. I'm giving myself to God. I fear the Lord. When we... Tell the story different. We're the victim and the Hebrew. We undermine the others. We endear ourselves at the expense of others. We lack the fear of the Lord. And David is being very direct about what's happening in the king's court. He's talking about people in Israel. He's talking about the king's leaders around him. He says, no, I'm going to walk in wisdom. I'm going to hold my speech. I'm not going to flatter myself. I'm not that important in the scheme of Saul. It doesn't matter where I'm at. I'm God. That's who I am. It's very, very powerful. He goes on, he says that, he says he has ceased to be wise, he has ceased to do good. 
the occasional good that Saul and men like him did gave way. The occasional good. They gave up on good and now they're doing evil without restraint, without remorse. They do evil without repentance. That's how sin works. Sin gradually lays a hold of us. That's why I tell young people, you don't want to play around with late night little pornography little shows and stuff. That thing will get a hold of you and people cease to do good. There's a time in their life where perversion, where addictions to things that we played around with in the early days. There's a time where we sin and we have no remorse about it. We have no grief about it. We have no restraint. We give up the fight and the argument to resist. And that's what David, it's graphic. He says they cease to even do good. They've given up the struggle to even fight against it. They just yield without remorse, without restraint. What a... Ugh. They devise wickedness on their bed. Of course, what David said on his bed that he did is he meditated on the law of the Lord. He says on their bed, they're thinking of ways. They've set themselves in a way that's not good. They've resolved to give up on the inward fight. They have no abhorrence of evil at all. There's no aversion. There's no horror. There's no grief. They're not scandalized when sin comes forth. It's what's happening in our nation right now. With what's happening in, in the... And the media surrounded the White House. The, the young people are... The nation's not scandalized by sin. It's just... It's, it's Judgment always follows on a nation when the abhorrence of sin is gone. There's just a few little voices lifting up. The inner debate is gone. The hesitation is gone. There's no protest. There's not even the patronizing of good. It's just like it doesn't matter. Do it because it's what you're, it's what you're called to do. It's how you're made. And sin is completely secularized and called a liberal spirit of doing your own thing, etc. It's a very, very, very difficult thing. Section 2. We'll leave this graphic picture of sin and there's so much more you can do with that. Uh, some of the commentaries I was reading, I mean, I was going, whoa, I mean, it's stinging. You know, I was going to some of the old Puritan writings on it. Those guys could really preach against sin, I'm telling you. They had some real exposés on those verses. I was going, my goodness. Sin is utterly sinful, but here's what God does. Here's, all of a sudden, David suddenly turns to the heavenly court. He suddenly begins to bring into focus who it is that he lives before. The one that's available to Saul that Saul doesn't care about. Again, the contrast of verse 1 to 4, the sinfulness of, of man with the beauty of God, verse 5 and 6, is deliberate because the contrast magnifies both of them. When you see the beauty of God and the fact He offers it freely, then sin is ridiculous to persevere in it. What are we doing? What are, why are we compromising when the beauty, which is the third section, the offer that God makes to give it to us? Again, the contrast magnifies both the beauty and the exceeding sinfulness of sin. He gives four statements in a row. But his message here is, and these four statements is, God is wooing and desiring the rebels of verse 1 to 4. That's, that's the powerful message. God longs to express mercy, faithfulness, righteousness to these very people that don't have any regard. He's wooing them to give them His mercy that reaches to the heavens. That's what David is... That's the, that's the oracle burning inside of David's heart is right there. Let's look at the first one. There's four attributes. Four lines of thought. To capture David in his early life. Your mercy, O God, is in the heavens. Or His mercy, there's different ways to interpret this. It's likened to the vastness of the heavens. The, the idea is the mercy of God is as vast as the heavens are, the stars and the atmosphere up above. Of course, we looked at Psalm 19. David was really captured by the spirit of revelation. I mean, it was uh, illumination on his heart. The spirit of revelation. He looked up at the stars. And David saw the beauty of the Lord in Psalm 19, and we looked at it, and David said it as immeasurable are the galaxies. Immeasurable. Beloved, there are 10 billion suns bigger than our sun in the galaxy. 10 billion of them. More than that. They say that the galaxy is expanding. If you heard it the other day, it's expanding at the speed of light. I don't understand it, but the, the scientists are saying it's growing. It's, it's going on. It's, it's more. It's, it's happening still immeasurable galaxies. Here's what God says. Ten billion suns brighter than the sun that shines upon the earth. The vast galaxies above you. 
that is a dim picture of the vastness of what my mercy will do if you'll say yes to me. My mercy is more vast than the heavens above. Beloved, this is a stunning statement. God is willing in kindness and in patience to utterly forgive and utterly embrace those in verse 1 to 4. If they would but come. David says, oh, he says, why would you play Saul's game and not fear God and do wicked and evil? There's the God of mercy that's as vast as the skies above. There's no way to exhaust it. There's no way to count it. There's no way to measure it. It's as vast that God would become a man and be crushed by the wrath of God. That you would be enthroned. You would be embraced and adorned by this God in the likeness of man. He goes, it's unthinkable with never ever a word brought up of your sin. Utterly delighted in by God and adorned and enthroned and embraced by the very God who, co who crossed that vast expanse to become a man to be crushed by the wrath of God. He goes, oh, the mercies of God, they are as vast as the ten billion suns in their width and length and breadth. Beloved, he became, the uncreated God became a man. Put his arms around us, gave us his beauty and shares his throne with us. The mercy of God is as vast as the heavens. It is as the heavens, is what David said. Number one, that's the first thing that he hits. Boy, you can work on that one for a lifetime. You'll never exhaust that one. This isn't just the one line of a song. This is a theme that David lived his entire life developing. These are themes. These are life messages that David grappled with and sought to grow in. And he was awestruck and he fell down in adoring worship before these four themes. And then he summarizes them all in verse 7. Number two theme, the faithfulness of God. Every promise that God's ever made, it's more than every promise. Every single person He's ever made them to, He's loyal to. He's not just faithful to promises, He's faithful to you. Every single one of you that have been uh, uh, heartbroken in a relationship by somebody that was unfaithful. Father, mother, brother, sister, lover, unfaithful. There is one who is Faithful forever and forever. Not just to His Word. Yes, He is faithful to you. To you as an individual. He will be loyal to you forever. David said, He's faithful to me. He's faithful like the clouds. The clouds were, they covered the sky. I mean, the whole globe. He looked up and saw the clouds. They were majestic. They were hard to control. Difficult to comprehend. The clouds above Him were out of His reach. He says, the faithfulness that I can't walk in bigger than my capacities and faithfulness I can't even comprehend. They're like the clouds. They refresh the whole earth. The faithfulness of God does. It's like the clouds. They're majestic. They're high. They're out of reach. They're mysterious. They refresh the whole world. The faithfulness of God is the source of the refreshing of the whole earth. It's like the clouds. They're high, and mysterious, beautiful, and refreshing. Look at the third life message of David. Again, these are not just sentences. These are themes he lived his whole life in. Your righteousness is like the great mountains, or the Hebrew says like the very mountains of God. But the, we'll talk about the great mountain ranges. Look at the mountain range, you know, the Rocky Mountains, the, the width, you know, as the pioneers were wanting to go west and get through the, the mountain ranges. Some of the stories, they were overwhelmed, not just at the beauty, but at the immensity of them because they said, we'll never ever make them. We'll never cross through them. We'll never get through them. The vastness of the mountain ranges is what God describes His righteousness, His character. His character is unmovable. It's firm. It's stable. It's set. Nothing can change it. The hurricane can come. The earthquake can come. They can destroy this town, the village. They can destroy, destroy the buildings of man. But I tell you, the Rocky Mountains are unmoved when the hurricane comes or when the tornado comes or when whatever comes, it's unmoved. The mountains are not moved by the fierceness of changing circumstances. They endure forever, the Scripture says. Of course, that's uh, uh, poetic language because one day the worth will be cast aside as a garment. It's impossible to move them. It's impossible to change them. It's impossible to shake a mountain. You get all the bulldozers of man. You can't plow through a mountain. It's unmoved by the winds, the storms, the technologies. Those things are there. God says, try as you might. Nothing will shake what is true about me, my character and my righteousness. David's looking at those, those men in Saul's court and saying, guys, 
You're not going to deceive him. You're not going to manipulate him. You're not. Uh, you might as well imitate him and receive the power to walk in that kind of righteousness. And the third one, I mean the fourth one, God's judgments are like the deep or like the ocean, the deep sea. Is, when it says the deep, it's talking about the deep seas. God's perfect administration of His creation. His perfect timing of releasing negative things that put a check to sin, that cause righteousness to increase. The administration of His judgments, all of God's judgments are calculated. None of them are too severe. None of them last too long. None of them come too late. None of them are in any way disproportionate to checking sin and producing love in the hearts of people that will say yes to God. God's administration of His judgments are like the great deep. Stand before the seashore. I just was standing before the sea just, just last week or two. I was in Florida. The mystery of the sea is really something. The irresistible power of the sea. It's, it's terrifying. It's perplexing. It's distressing. There's, there's 10,000 worlds below the sea of life. And there's 10,000 stories of the created order and beauty beneath that water there. And the way that the, the, the deep, it's unsearchable in its mysteries. You can't measure it. You can't comprehend it. You can't control it. It has a hidden logic in it that you can't... It's baffling scientists. They, they want to know how they can control the clouds and the seas to get control of planet Earth. The angry man stands before the judgments of God and, and dares to challenge God's wisdom and kindness in His judgments. And why God? He demands in an angry way, why? Why God? And God says, my judgments are beyond your grasp of understanding. They are like the deep seas and their mystery and their power. But God, I made an A in math. Like the first grader, arrogantly, I made the A in math. Tell me the secrets of advanced calculus. The arrogant man stands so confident in his reason and his logic. And God says, I have profound mysteries like to see that in all of your skill and your first grade math, you cannot understand the secrets of advanced calculus. You have no capacity to understand my judgments. David honors the judgments of God. I love what he says in verse 6. He says this actually four times. He says the word, oh. Oh, is the, is, he's expressing the overwhelming adoration of the discovery of these beauties. Oh, the discovery, the fresh realization. He says, oh, he says it in verse 5. He says it in verse 6, verse 7, and verse 10. Four times the oracle, the burning heart is loose. David, oh, God, he's overcome. Don't read that and say, oh, Lord, you preserve man. No, 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 you don't do that. The O oh is the burning oracle. David is beside himself. He's on fire. He looks at the wicked man in verse 1 to 4. He looks at the beauty of God's mercy, faithfulness, righteousness, and the mystery of His judgment. And he says, you do all of these things to preserve the welfare of human beings. You exercise such power, such transcendent majesty for the good of humans and for the good of the beasts of the field. He goes, what king would use his power for lowly people that sin against him? He says, the king that I serve, I have served him well. And he's trying to get rid of me with this power. But God, you use your power. Even the rebels you seek to preserve, to give them a way to turn that you could give them the mercies and the beauties of God. Look at it. When David saw these four things about the beauty of God, he was overwhelmed. He concluded David's theology, David's whole application of life. God does it for the care of human beings. That you would preserve us. Who's the us? It's the people in verse 1 to 4. Sinners that He could redeem them. For God is, is very, very patient that He could bring the, the, the wicked to repentance. That's what He says. The ocean, the deep ocean of judgment, that vast deep ocean, is like a mirror across the Pacific Ocean that reflects the blue heavens, the mercy of God. God says your judgments reflect your mercies. All four of them together. See, you don't want to just take them one by one. It's good to study them one by one. But what David was overwhelmed by was the combination of the four of them together. That God never suspends one attribute to exercise another. 
in God's judgments, in those deep blue judgments, it was the mirror of the sky of mercy. God's judgments and mercy are perfectly in line with one another. And they all were for the good of God's creation. God used His power not as a bully, but to glorify broken, sinful, fragile human beings that would come to Him. These are four facets of one gleaming diamond, the heart of Jesus Christ. It's not four different propensities. It's four facets. It's four ways to look at one diamond. It's one heart. I remember uh, studying somewhere some years ago. It was A.W. Tozer. I believe it, it was him that said, he said, the beauty of who God is is not the the unity of all of His parts. He goes, it's not. It's better than that. It's the absence of parts that describes the unity of God. God is 100% infinitely everything He possesses. He is infinite in it. He has no parts. He is one undiluted flow of the complete symmetry of all of these attributes of beauty coming together in fullness out of the same diamond. Something like that. Eh? I read it some years ago. And that's what David is captured, not just by the mercy, not just by the faithfulness, not just by the righteousness, not just by judgment, but the four of them together for the people of verse 1 to 4. He goes, oh, God, he goes, oh, why do people keep sinning? Why do they think that you're a bad deal? Why do they think you're burdensome? All you've ever done on our behalf is reign to bring us into glory. Today, after I got through studying this, I said, Lord, I'm just going to quit sinning. This is ridiculous. It's stupid to sin. Of course, I'll sin again. Okay, verse 7. But it just seems so stupid. He sums it up. He sums it up. He's now completely overwhelmed. He throws in one of the oh gods again. One of those oh, the burning oracle. How precious is your kindness, your loving kindness, oh God. He goes, oh. He sums up the four attributes all together in the passion of God's love. He goes, how precious. David is now entering the Holy of Holies, that vast ocean of the love of God. He stands, he says, oh, how precious, how rare, how valuable, how beautiful. The very jewel of life itself, the love of God, the diamond that David gazes in at every facet that he can see by the Spirit of God. That's the diamond, the love of God right there with all the facets of righteousness, judgment, mercy, faithfulness. He says in verse 8, that they are the. Well, let me say one more thing about verse 7. Beloved, it does you well to focus your whole life on studying the preciousness of that jewel. That diamond, many faceted diamond, the heart of our God, Christ Jesus, filled with passion and desire for you. For you. It overwhelmed the great worshiper of the Old Testament as he entered literally to the very Holy of Holies of understanding in the Old Testament sense. There it is, verse 7. He's now into the third part of the psalm, verse 7 to 9, describing his experience. The God of beauty wants to give it to sinners now. The God of beauty wants to bring people into the delight of it themselves. The God of delight wants His people delighted. The God of pleasure wants us filled with pleasure. The power of our life is the fact that pleasure courses through our being. The superior pleasures that come by the revelation of God. That divine, uh, that illumination that was on David is flowing on him in a powerful way as he writes this psalm. I love the story of St. Augustine. As he uh, was doing his commentary on Psalm 36, verse 8, when he was talking about the verse here in verse 8, you give them to drink from the river of your pleasure. He, he, he writes in his commentary right there that as he's writing on and contemplating the joys of revelation and the joys of eternity, the audible voice of the Lord breaks out like thunder over him as he's writing. He heard the audible voice of the Lord a couple times in his life. The audible voice of the Lord breaks in like thunder the very moment he's writing. The commentary on verse 8, though, you, you let them drink from the river of your pleasure. He said, are you able to put all the oceans of the world into one little pot? Stunning question. It came like thunder. Are you able to put all the oceans of the world in one little pot? And Augustine says, no. He says, neither are you able to comprehend with your small mind 
the eternal joys that await you. Neither are you able to comprehend with your small mind the ocean of joys that await you. He heard that by the audible voice of God. Let me tell you, beloved, you can't comprehend in the very beginning the ocean of pleasure awaiting you in redemption. And yet we walk around without the fear of God, victims and making ourselves the hero and telling the story and lying and deceit and climbing up the ladder and twisting things and trying to get ahead with Saul. And, and David says, why would you want to get ahead with Saul when you could be in the embrace of the monarch Christ Jesus of all the ages? This was real to David. That's why he acted wisely. When it says he acted wisely, that's not just poetry. He held himself. He said, no, nah, I don't care about growing in Saul's court. I know where the court I'm going to live in. He enters into the very court of the Lord here. In verse 7 to 9. The river of God's pleasure. Fantastic. As David's describing, he's abundantly satisfied. Psalm 16, verses 9 to 11 brings us into the same thing. David gives a number of descriptions of this satisfaction. The problem is, this vast ocean of love and pleasure, we've come to just kind of like make uh, Easter cards out of it, Christmas cards, kind of a neat little thing, you know, in the fullness of joy. And it's not a reality. It's a, it's a postcard. The voice thundered to Augustine. Neither are you able to comprehend in your small mind the ocean of delight awaiting you. Eternal delights that are awaiting you. The vast ocean. Well, David's doctrine is stated clearly. God gives us superior pleasures. That's how He gets us out of sin. That's how He, he passed the test in Saul's court. Because of superior pleasures. He knew a little bit. A little bit. Just a little bit. But a little bit goes a long way. The satisfaction of God's house. David makes one of the greatest statements in the book of Psalms. You give them. He's talking to God. He's talking with permission. He's talking by revelation. You let the divinely created thirst that you put in our design. We thirst. You let our thirst be satisfied at the river of your pleasure. He said, God, the thirst you put in me. When you created me as a man, you put a thirst in me. As Jesus Christ hung on the cross and said, I thirst. So every sinful man that's ever walked on earth, we thirst with the thirst that's been put in us by God. And David proclaimed, he prophesied by the spirit of revelation, God not only permits, but woos us to drink at the river of pleasure if we want to go and drink, but he will not force anybody to drink of his delights. It's contrary to the very understanding of delight. Voluntary lovers is what he's calling. David introduces the river. Psalm 46, verse 4, it's called the river that makes the people of God glad. There's a river. Beloved, it's a real river. It's not just a metaphor, it's real. Daniel 7, verse 10, it's a river of fire. Daniel 7, 10. Revelation 22, it's a river of water. There's, there's a river. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. He manifests as fire and water. He manifests in His liquid form as water and His that other form is fire. He manifests His presence in these ways in the eternal city. For real. That's not just imagery. He literally manifests His splendor as water and fire as one river with two different manifestations of it flowing out of the throne of God. And we will drink from it forever. But beloved, it doesn't begin then. It doesn't just begin then. It began the day we were born again if we would give ourselves to it. David says, I found something more important than Saul. I found more, something more important than being the main guy in his army. I found something more important than the armies of Israel. I'm drinking and satisfying my thirst at the river. I found a river. I want to ask you a question. Have you found the river? And I don't mean, you know, people have been talking about the renewal like that's the river. I'm talking about the revelation of God touching the inner man. There is a river that God created for you to drink in. Well, I haven't found the river. I'm just real mad about everything and I'm going to satisfy my thirst at every other spoiled, poisoned well. Beloved, there's a river you can drink in. So what? They ripped you off. So what? They lied about you. They took your money and you lost your place. There's a river you can drink at. There really is. I'm just a little bit starting to find that river this last couple of years. I'm going, I don't need this other stuff. I'll do it 
You know, if God wants to make me be rich and famous, I'll do it at gunpoint. Because let me tell you, being rich and famous will nearly destroy your ability to walk in God. Unless you're just a rare person, because all the cares of life that consume you. I says, I'll do big stuff at gunpoint, but if you don't force me, I'm going to the river. I know, I've already found what I'm about. I found my way a little bit to a river, and I'm going to live in it. I want to say this, that God, if God gives you a big platform, it's going to cause trouble to your life. God gives you great wealth. He may really make you do it. But don't beg Him for those things. Do those at gunpoint. I was talking Sunday about the, about the contemplative people through history. St. John of the Cross and these kind of guys, they just treated them all wrong. I said that they got threatened by the power, the oracle burning in their heart, and they took these guys, all kinds of them. It's right through history. Same crazy strategy. They took what they, they took them, they put them in prison. They gave them a lifestyle of being alone and praying and fasting. It's the only thing they ever wanted. Nobody can get to them. No appointments. Nobody can disrupt them. They're in prison. You don't take a contemplative and give them prayer and fasting and take everything off their plate. If you want to wreck a complaint, if you want to shut the mouth of St. John of the Cross, make him popular and you, he'll lose his fire. Let him stand before kings. Don't put him in prison and let him pray and fast. And then they gave him a pencil and paper. Oh, I mean, he started a revolution that's burning to this day. You don't give him pen and paper. You don't let him pray and fast. You get him busy. You make him popular. You give him money. You help him out. You give them what other men want that they hate, and you'll wreck them and destroy them, and they'll lose their fire. That's how you, that's how you beat St. John on the cross. You don't put him in prison. You don't let him pray and fast. That's the one thing you don't want those guys doing if you're an evil king. My question is, have you found the river? A little bit, just a little bit. I don't mean, are you in it deep? Is in your view, is there a vision in your mind that there really is a river? It's better than the king's court. I tell you, there is one. I just know a little bit about it. God is awakening my thirst more and more. The crazy thing is that men would rather live in sin than drink the river of pleasure. They would pursue pleasure in sin and refuse the free river. goes on to verse 9. David saw an inexhaustible fountain of life in God. He said, God, you, you, not Saul, not his court... You are the fountain of life. I'm in the spirit of revelations all over him. All the origin of natural and spiritual life. Angels, people, animals, insects, plants. The planets themselves, all life flows from you. Now, the created beings have life, but God the Creator is the fountain of life. Jesus stood before John. He said in, on the island of Patmos in Revelation 1, was he's laying as a dead man, he said, I have the keys of life. You have life. But life is mine because of who I am. I drink from my own well. I gave you life as a gift. I am the fountain of life, John. God draws existence from His own supply. We have an existence given to us as a gift. God draws from the well of His own supply of His eternal existence. He is the fountain. I tell you, the most vigorous, powerful, anointed, I mean, not anointed, but uh, uh, all these people, in Saul's court, they are like dead men without the life of God flowing and coursing through their beings. Look what he says, David says. He says, he sums it up right there. In your light we see light. One of the great statements of the Psalms. David says, I posture myself to look at your light. Let's look at the first. There's two lights mentioned. First one, he says, I, the idea is I posture myself to gaze at your light. I derive my truth and my pleasure by looking at the light of God through the Word. We call it devotional prayer. We call it meditating on the Word. We look at into God's light, the light of God's Word. David says, I'll posture myself gazing into light, and in that place I receive the spirit of illumination. I posture myself to look at your light through the Word of God, through creation. I, I study your handiwork to see your beauty. I study your written word to see your beauty. And in the studying for you, you give the spirit of illumination to me. In your light, in the gazing on you, I receive the spirit of understanding. That's the place where we receive it. David knew where his life was, gazing into the light of God. And then the last thing, the last four, uh, fourth part, 
is David's prayer. And I'll just look at it, uh, just a thought or two of it because we're running out of time here. Look at verse 10. Oh, I love verse 10. He's now in the prayer mode. He wants more. Continue to manifest the ocean of your love to me. That's in essence what he's saying. He goes, Lord, continue. He goes, I've seen it. I saw it in verse 5 and 6. He goes, verse 7, it's precious. All the pleasures touch me. Lord, I'm not sending out my resume to get back in Saul's team. I'm not getting on the telephone lines telling everybody what Saul did. He goes, nope, that's not where I'm going. I'm going swimming in the river of God. He says, verse 10, Oh, continue the unfolding of the vast ocean of God to my experience. Look at that. Verse 10, that's the same thing as saying, I behold the beauty of the Lord. He goes, unfold the beauty of your love to me. Let me swim in it. Let me get lost in it. Let me stand before that vast ocean, that thrilling, terrifying, dangerous ocean called the love of God. Oh, it's vast. It's strong. It's deep. I, I tell you, again, I was standing a week or so ago before the ocean, looking at it, thinking of the vast ocean of the love of God. I, I said that phrase. I like that phrase. I was looking at it. Ooh, the mystery of it. And there were, there were just little weak little storms on the horizon, a little lightning and thunder. And I was going, oh, man. I said, this is a dim picture of something really big. And I was looking out there, and I was thinking of the mysterious, overpowering, endless ocean of the being of God and His love. And just the billows of God's love crush all doubt and brokenness in us and bring us into His love. It's, I was just terrified and delighted. I said, oh, God, who are you anyway? Who are you anyway? And I was beckoning that, holy, that escort into that vast ocean called the Holy Spirit. I said, oh, those are scary waters out there. And just thinking of the Holy Spirit whispering in my ear, you know, just imagining Him saying, let me bring you 500 miles out there, just you and me. I go, ah, you know, I'd rather stay on the shore for now, you know. <laughs> and He says, oh, that fiery, terrifying, thrilling, ocean of God. I can escort you out there safely. Oh, he's terrifying. He's bigger than you think. And I was going, Lord, I, I want to do it. I want to go in slow. You know, I want to go in slow. And the Lord just puts in our hearts that the endless eternity we'll be exploring that vast ocean. And then he's talking about righteousness uh, 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 being released into his life. And the righteousness, he means that the injustice would be checked. The injustice happening in the court. And then he gives three or, two or three descriptions of the injustice there in verse 11 and 12. He talks about the injustice. He's saying, bring me to the ocean of divine love and stop the injustice in your timing. He says, I'll leave the timing to check the injustice. I want you to stop it, but I'll leave the timing with you. I'm not going to stop it. I want you to stop it. I'm not going to get on the phone lines and stop it. I'm going to let you stop it. You stop the injustice. You establish righteousness for me. You cause the proud men to be stopped. And then he gives a prophecy. Verse 12, he says, There, the workers of iniquity have fallen. They've been cast down and are not able to rise. And that is understood by the majority of the commentators as a prophecy of the ultimate demise of the wicked at the very end of the age. There, in the manifestation of love and the manifestation of righteousness. The there, verse 12, goes to verse 10. The manifestation of love and the checking of injustice in the final hour, God would cause all sinners to be brought down and totally stopped. And David says, why then would you want to live a life of sin? It cannot be stopped. It cannot prevail. And there's an ocean of pleasure. There's divine light that God wants to release into us. Well, amen and amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.